Today we've got uh, Jeremy Appleyard who's going to uh, uh, give you a lecture about GPUs. Jeremy's from NVIDIA um, and uh, NVIDIA have become very important in, in deep learning because they make all the GPUs that we use to run all of our, um, all of our algorithms. So Jeremy's going to tell you a bit about why GPUs are different to CPUs and what you have to think about to actually make some of the, the things we've been talking about, I think RNNs in particular we'll talk about, um, work on GPU hardware. Uh, so thanks very much, Jeremy, and boy. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I, I work in NVIDIA, and my, my job at NVIDIA is to um, make applications run as fast as possible. Uh, in particular, I work on deep learning and neural network applications and uh, I try to make them run as fast as possible. To do that, you have to understand both the hardware and the software, um, and I'm gonna go through a few sort of tools that you can use to estimate the performance, not just on GPUs, but on, on general hardware of particular algorithms. And then I'm gonna apply that to uh, an LSTM network and show you some speed ups that you can get just from a few optimizations on it. So, firstly, I thought I'd start with some, some motivation. Um, wh why should uh, somebody studying machine learning, somebody studying uh, natural language processing care about performance? Uh, you know, it's, it's, you're going to get the same answer. Why does it matter if it takes a bit longer? Well, I guess I, I'm going to split this into two regimes. You've got the, the training regime and you've got the, the production environment, the test time regime. When you're doing training, uh, if you do a, a large model on lots of data, training can take yeah, up to a month, maybe a bit longer for a single model. That's a long time. You don't want to get two weeks in and find you have a bug, which means it's not going to converge beyond a certain point. Uh, some models are cheaper. You know, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a day. But the same applies. You, you, you don't want to be halfway through your training run, have... have been waiting for this result for you know, X hours, and then only to find out that it's not going to work. So the other thing is, if you run faster, you can do more trials. So if your uh, particular network takes only an hour to train, that's great. That's, that's not very long. Well, if it only took 10 minutes, then you could train six times as many different architectures. You could try six times as many experiments. So performance is important for training because uh, it lets you get more work done in the same amount of time. In production environments, uh, providing a quick result is, is crucial. So if I've got, for example, a speech-to-text thing on my phone, I don't want me to talk to the phone and it give me a result in five minutes. I need that result as quickly as possible. Ideally, it should be you know, coming back to me before I even finish saying my words. That's the sort of speed I want. If that's my restriction, then it puts a limit on how many operations you can do in your model, how large a model can be. So if you can train a given model or test on a given model in less time, you can then have some freedom to increase the model size, get more accuracy. Now, uh, you may be thinking, well, this isn't my job. I mean, th th there are people building deep learning frameworks and building software libraries specifically designed to accelerate these applications. I, I don't have to worry about it. I can put all my faith in them. And to a certain extent, it's true. Uh, the frameworks do a lot of work for you. The libraries do a lot of work for you. But that doesn't completely uh, remove your responsibility when it comes to performance. Th there are still things you can do which can change the, the performance of your network by orders of magnitude. And uh, you should probably be aware of these. So that's what I'm going to go into. I'm going to uh, go into some, as I said, uh, ways of analyzing the performance of networks and changes that you might make to accelerate your networks. So I'm going to start off by talking about hardware. So I, I work at NVIDIA. We make GPUs. Um, a lot of you may know NVIDIA from, from gaming. Uh, so we've been making gaming GPUs since the 90s. Uh, in the last 10, almost 10 years, We've also been making GPUs for high-performance computing. Uh, this started out as sort of uh, scientific computing, weather simulation, and, and such like. And more recently, uh, we've been making GPUs with deep learning in mind. Now, these are our general-purpose processors. 
you can write code that looks almost exactly like C code, and you can run it on your GPU. The difference is that they are highly parallel. They're optimized for highly parallel tasks where you have uh, many operations at once. This has been termed embarrassingly parallel before. Um, it, it means that you have tens of thousands of operations at once. It's not, not, not 10, not 20, not 100, tens of thousands of concurrent operations. Now, it turns out that, that deep learning is a task like this. You, you have tens of thousands of concurrent operations when you're training a deep learning model. They may not be large operations. They may be something as, as trivial as a, a single floating point addition, but you have tens of thousands of them that you can execute concurrently, which means the GPU is very well suited to uh, tasks such as deep learning. So there's a hardware difference here. The CPU is optimized for serial tasks, where the GPU is optimized for massively parallel tasks. And how is this done? So on the left here, I have uh, you know, a very basic diagram of, of what a CPU may look like. And on the right, I have a very basic diagram of what a GPU may look like. And you can see that the GPU has a lot more space dedicated to ALUs, or uh, arithmetic units. This is because uh, it's optimized for throughput. Uh, the CPU, on the other hand, is optimized for latency. The CPU is optimized such that when you ask for a specific piece of memory, for example, it will get that one piece of memory to you as quickly as it can. If you ask it to do an operation, it will do that operation and free up any dependencies as quickly as it can. This means it needs large caches. It needs complex control uh, to do out-of-order execution and um, things like branch prediction. And all of this takes space and power. Uh, the GPU knows that you're running a highly parallel operation on it. This is, this is the design space it's built for. It's built for a highly parallel operation. This means that it can be optimized slightly differently. We know that um, on a GPU, we don't have to optimize this latency. So for example, um, if I'm on a GPU and I ask for a piece of data, I don't have to worry about that data coming back to me instantly because I know it's gonna take a while so I can just start working on another piece of data. Then I can start working on another piece of data, then another piece. All these pieces of data are independent, they're all parallel, so I can do a, a throughput-based approach. I can do work while I'm waiting for stuff to return. A CPU isn't designed with that in mind so much. This means we're tolerant of latencies and we can just squeeze more transistors onto the chip for computation and uh, we don't you know, spend as much power, so that energy efficiency argument in here as well, we don't spend as much power doing this extra work to reduce the latency. So this, this slide describes that, that latency hiding I just talked about. Let's say we have four tasks. Let's say they're independent, and the G CPU is only capable of processing one task at a time. It's a simplified model. Uh, GPUs have many cores as well, but bear with me. Uh, so the GPU, on the other hand, can do all four tasks at once. Um, so when you're on the CPU, you can only do one task at a time. Your only option is to do task one, wait until it's done, task two, wait until it's done, task three, etc. The GPU, you start task one, you then go, oh no, there's gonna be a long latency here. Uh, that's not great, but you know now that you've got task two and task two is independent, so you then launch task two. Do some work on task two, then you hit a, a, a stall, something which has a dependency and will be waiting for something, so we launch task three. And then same again, launch task four. By the time task four has finished its sort of initialization processing, Task one is once again ready to execute. That, that latency has been covered by work. This means that when we have this, this highly parallel uh, problem, we can, we can cover the, the latency of the machine with work. This lets us get much higher throughputs. You know, we're, we're optimized for throughput, not latency. So how does that look in terms of performance? This graph shows the performance in terms of uh, single precision floating point operations of GPUs and CPUs for the last, uh, what's this, 14 years? So since 2003. And you can see it's a, it's a log scale, and you can see that on the y-axis, so you can see that the GPU has been consistently an order of magnitude just under 10x uh, more throughput than the CPU. And this is held true uh, right back since, since, well, more than 10 years ago. Uh, Floating point throughput is one throughput that you can be bound by. The other throughput that you can be bound by on a piece of hardware 
is memory bandwidth. So how fast can you fetch data from memory? And you see a similar, similar trend. Um, this, again, goes back to 2003. And you can see that the GPU has almost 10x the memory throughput of a CPU, which means we can move about 10 times as much data to and from memory uh, in a given amount of time. Now, this throughput, as I mentioned before, does require parallelism. It doesn't work on, on sequential processes. So I've said I've introduced those two limits to, to performance, the floating point throughput and the memory bandwidth. And um, I guess it's useful to know for a given algorithm which you're likely to hit. So you, so you can't go faster than the, the, the floating point throughput and you can't go faster than the memory bandwidth. But uh, so th and, and this essentially means that, that a given algorithm is, is theoretically going to be bound by one of them. It may be bound by other things as well, but, but you will have theoretical limits based on your algorithm, and it will be one of these two things. So um, in terms of useful work, it's the floating point operations. They, they are useful things. To do a matrix multiplication, for example, it's the floating point operations we want to maximize. They're the things that, that are the, the, the maths, the sums that get us the answer that we want. So that's the useful work. Uh, if we can double that, then we double uh, how fast we process our, our task, how fast we get to our data sets in, in our neural network um, application. That means we train twice as fast, everyone's happy. A roofline model is a plot for a given algorithm and a no, plot for a given architecture, actually, uh, of, of um, uh, computational intensity on the, the x-axis and throughput on the y-axis. So a given algorithm will have a given computational intensity, and this places it on this, this roofline model. Computational intensity is de defined as the number of floating point operations we do per byte. So um, if we move one byte and do one floating point in, uh, operation, the computational intensity will be, will be one. If we do move one byte and do two floating point operations, we're twice as computationally intense. We do more computations per byte. So these are roofline plots for the 2006 uh, CPU and GPU from the previous plots. We've got the arithmetic intensity, as I said, uh, it's the same as the computational intensity on the x-axis and the arithmetic throughput or floating point throughput on the y-axis. So that's, that's what we want to maximize. So ideally, we want to be in this, this right-hand side area. We want to be uh, where the line is horizontal. That means we are getting the most out of our piece of hardware. If we were in the left-hand region where it's sloping, it means that we're limited by bandwidth. It means that theoretically our hardware could be doing more floating point operations, but we're limited by how fast we can move memory. You can see that both the CPU and the GPU actually have a, a similar sort of corner on our roofline model. They, they, they go horizontal at about the same point. And that is an arithmetic intensity of about 16. Um, so above an arithmetic intensity of 16, you would hope that your algorithm would be compute bound. It would be limited by the amount of floating point operations you could do. That's good. Below that, it's limited by how, much, how fast you can move memory. That's not so good. So I've listed in a table uh, five operations and their arithmetic intensities. First one, C equals A plus B. So we need to load Let's assume 32 uh, bits here. We need to load A, we need to load B, and we need to store C. So we're moving 12 bytes, four bytes for A, four bytes for B, four bytes for C. We do one floating point operation. That's the addition. So we have 12 bytes, one flop. And the arithmetic intensity of this is 0 0.083, or a 12, which is way off the left of this graph. So this particular operation is heavily bandwidth bound. Um, if we could somehow reduce the bandwidth of this, let's say we knew that uh, A was equal to B, then we can move it right on the graph and we could increase our computational throughput. Um, because then we'd only have to load uh, one value instead of two. Uh, the next one on the list is a matrix vector multiplication. So that has to load order n squared bytes. Uh, so that's essentially 
the matrix. I mean, the ve vector is, is small compared to the matrix, assuming n is more than tiny. Um, so that's order n squared bytes, and it's order n squared flops. So we have to do uh, two floating point operations, as it turns out, approximately, for each element of the matrix. So the arithmetic intensity of a matrix vector multiplication is approximately 1. So it's order magnitude 1. So again, we would expect this to be uh, quite heavily bandwidth bound. Uh, next one is a 1D FFT. Uh, that works out as uh, order at log n arithmetic intensity. So exactly where this sits on the plot is going to depend on the constant factors and the size of n. So for a large n, it may, may be computationally bound. Uh, in practice, 1D FFTs are usually bandwidth bound for, for most sizes of n that are used. And then you have a matrix matrix multiplication. Now, this is a, a typical example of a computationally bound problem. That is to say, we have n cubed flops, n squared bytes, giving an arithmetic intensity of order n. This means that for a, you know, a square matrix of a reasonable size, we're well to the right hand side of this plot. We are compute bound. We're expecting to be at the floating point performance of the GPU. The final column uh, row is uh, R and Ns. So R and Ns are harder to quantify because uh, they are not, while they may feature matrix matrix multiplications, uh, this approximation on here is for square matrix matrix multiplications. R and Ns would typically have quite thin uh, right hand side matrices, uh, not right hand side, B matrices. So the second term in your, your multiplication. Ten, tends to be quite thin, which, which can move it to, to something that looks a bit like a matrix vector multiplication. So on the whole, I would say that RNNs uh, fit somewhere in this spectrum, but it's not entirely clear just, just by saying RNN where. So the next few slides, I'm going to go look at some RNNs and see where they will fit on this plot and see if there's anything you can do to influence where they fit on this plot. Ideally, you would influence it such that they are more arithmetically intense and we get more percentage of throughput. So we're going to look at LSTM in particular. Um, probably the most commonly used RNN. Uh, I think it was in a lecture last week, um, and I'm going to use the equations from that lecture. Slightly reordered, but they're the same equations. So on the left here, I have the equations for an LSTM. Um, they feature a lot of matrix vector multiplications, the input of which is size 2h, if our, if our hidden state size uh, h, uh, if we have a hidden state size of h, say that's a hidden state size of h, um, and the output is, is h. And we have four of these, uh, one with wi, one with wf, one with wo, and one with wc. We then have one matrix vector multiplication with input h and output H, and that is uh, WHCT down there in the last equation. And then we have a whole bunch of pointwise operations. So two pointwise tan H's, uh, that takes uh, size H vector in, does a tan H on each of the, the elements of the, um, the vector, and then spits out the output. Three sigmoids, which are the same, but sigmoids instead of tan H. And similarly with additions and multiplications. So that's what we have to do uh, for uh, the LSTM we saw last week. Now, I'm going to slightly change this LSTM. Uh, in practice, I find that most people don't use this, this um, multiplication in the last equation, uh, WHCT. Normally, people just pass CT in my experience. So we're going to simplify it a little bit. Um, it doesn't, doesn't change the analysis that much. It just makes it a little bit easier down the line. Um, and I would say that this formulation is probably a little bit more common. Uh, and that, so that, that gets rid of one of our matrix vector multiplications and one of our pointwise additions. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do to this is add a mini batch. So that was assuming that we are feeding just one, uh, one um, sequence into the model. Uh, in reality, when you, we train especially, we are feeding multiple sequences into the model at once. We are mini batching. Um, and this is partly because uh, mini-batches uh, have been shown to help a little bit with convergence and, and partly because actually they're more efficient on hardware and we'll see why uh, very soon. 
So that changes things from matrix vector multiplications to matrix matrix multiplications and gives a width on all of these arguments. So now we're doing h times b 10 h's instead of h 10 h's. Um, the final change I'm going to make is to increase parallelism somewhat. So you'll see in, in the previous equation uh, the um, second argument in these, these matrix, matrix multiplications. So wt, uh, semicolon ht minus 1, that concatenation is constant in all four of our, uh, our terms here. It's the same term uh, as the second argument there. It's a different left-hand side, different first argument, but uh, the same second argument. And there's a transformation we can do on this. Uh, so if we, if we combine all our um, four matrices into a, a single matrix, multiply them by this, this, uh, this common uh, input, we then get a four times larger output. Um, this is just, it's functionally the same. It gives you a bit more parallelism. So previously I was talking about how GPUs need parallelism. This gives you a four times larger output uh, matrix, which gives you about four times more parallelism. So that's quite a, uh, a neat trick, which is quite commonly employed for LSTM and similar. So we do that, and now we have uh, one matrix matrix multiplication here, uh, combining all of WI, WF, WO, and WC um, with a larger output but the same size input. So this is what we're going to work on. And um, the first thing we're going to look at is this matrix matrix multiplication. So as we saw earlier, um, well, so ma matrix matrix multiplications are, are computationally in intense. That is where we expect most of our work to be. Um, in terms of floating point operations, almost all of the floating point operations are in this matrix matrix multiplication. When you look at bandwidth, uh, the, the, a similar thing is true. Most of the bandwidth is in this matrix matrix multiplication. I don't prove that, but you can, you can check it for yourself and you'll find that that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. The, the bandwidths for some values of H and B may be, may be similar, but um, the floating point operations are all in matrix matrix multiplication. So we're gonna take a look at that. So um, in uh, high performance computing parlance, matrix matrix multiplications are often known as GEM. And this comes from the 70s BLAS standard, basic linear algebra subprograms. And GEM was the name of the routine that does a matrix matrix multiplication. Um, so similarly, GEM V, so G E M V, was the one that does the uh, matrix vector multiplication. So these terms are still in, in use today. And uh, NVIDIA has a, a QBLAS library which implements uh, the 70 standard BLAS in, on, on the GPU. So um, when we're looking at GEM, uh, we can parameterize the matrix matrix multiplication C equals AB by three matrix dimensions, which are typically called M, N, and K. Um, they are shown in the diagram at the bottom. Uh, so the output matrix C is M by N, uh, the input matrix A is M by K, and the input matrix B is K by N. Um, the floating point operations required for a matrix matrix multiplication is M, N. So for each of the output uh, elements, we need to do 2K minus 1 uh, floating point operations to calculate it. It's 2K minus 1 because as we go along the uh, rows of A and the columns of B. Uh, we process K elements, each of which needs a multiplication and then an addition to the current running sum uh, to calculate uh, the single element in C. Uh, the minus one comes from the fact that you don't have to do an addition on the first, uh, for the first K element. Um, and typically, uh, K is much larger than one, so we can, we can throw that away just to simplify things a bit and call it to approximately equal to 2MNK. Bytes through memory, so we have to load A once, we have to load B once, and we have to store C once. So it's the size of our data type times uh, MK plus KN plus MN. So that is for loading A, loading B, and storing C. So that give us, gives us the, the flops, the floating point ops, for a matrix matrix multiplication in terms of M, N, and K. And it gives us the 
uh, memory bandwidth required in terms of M, N, and K. By taking a ratio of these, we can find the arithmetic intensity for a uh, gem, a matrix matrix multiplication. So how does this, this tie back to LSTMs? So for LSTMs, uh, with the input and output shapes, you can uh, infer that M is 4H, N is B, and K is 2H. If you go back to the equations, you'll find that that should match up. And that gives us a, um, an equation in terms of H and B for floating point tops, and an equation in terms of H and B uh, for bytes through memory in FP32. So we've got a factor of four there at, front, at the front to say we have four bytes for a floating point 32 number. Uh, by taking the ratio of these, uh, we get a flops to byte ratio. And that works out as 2HB uh, by 3B plus 4H. Now, this, thinking back, um, I said uh, early on that the arithmetic intensity of a matrix matrix multiplication was expected to be order n. Now, if we were to say that b was equal to h, we could see that we had n squared on the left and a term in n on the right of this ratio. So that confirms here that we are seeing something that is order n. However, we don't have n. We have h and b. And h and b are often quite different. Uh, b is our mini batch, h is our hidden state size, and typically h is significantly larger than b. It's not the case for all uh, LSTMs, uh, but if you're working on a large data set uh, with a large model, it's, it's likely to be true. So, in general, if you, if you have a model, you don't want to mess around with H for performance. H is, is something that's quite crucial to, to how your model um, predicts, how, how well your model works. So you don't really want to change it much. Um, B, however, you have a bit more flexity, flexibility. So that's about, about the data. We, we could pass 64 training examples through at once. We could pass 128 training examples through at once. We could pass four if we wanted to. So we have a bit of flexibility there, and it, it will impact on convergence, but it won't have nearly so much of an impact as, as changing age. So let's take a look at um, what, what impact B actually has. So it... it, it does impact your training memory requirements. So typically these will scale linearly with B. So if I double the batch size, I need twice as much uh, memory to store everything for the, uh, the backward pass. And that can very quickly add up. Uh, for a large model, you're already using quite a lot of memory. A lot of the time, if you suddenly double it by doubling your mini batch, you can run out of memory and that can cause problems. Uh, if your batch size is too large or too small, you have convergence problems usually. Um, so th there's a limit there. It's usually, I think, uh, you can go quite small before you get convergence problems. You can go quite large before you get convergence problems. Um, in deployment, now this is a, an interesting case. If you're, if you're actually deploying your, your deep learning model out in the field, you often only have a few samples to actually uh, do your tests on. So for example, um, if I have some sort of embedded uh, hardware and it's doing some natural language processing task, it has to do the natural language processing task on board. It can't send it off to a cloud to be batched or anything like that. Um, it is likely to have a batch size of one. That is to say, if it's doing speech to text, for example, I will talk to it. That is the thing that it's, it's working on. It doesn't have other things that I've said uh, that I need the answer for. It's just the thing I said just then. So the batch size in that case would be one. Uh, in reality, a lot of these devices send things off to the cloud, and, and that allows you to batch across requests from multiple users. And so you often have more than, more than one batching in, uh, in inference cases. So here is my roofline model for LSTM. This is on my uh, P100 GPU and with an H of 2048. Turns out it doesn't actually vary that much with H, but it will vary a little bit with hardware. So um, it's important to specify the hardware here. Now, the key thing I'd like to point out here is where the corner is. The corner is at a mini batch of 32. What does this actually mean for performance? This means that if you are doing a matrix matrix multiplication where uh, the, the second argument is a mini batched vector, 
If you have a mini batch of less than 32, you are probably going to be bandwidth bound. This is a pretty big deal for performance. So if you have a mini batch of eight, for example, you'll be running at half of the throughput, half of the useful throughput as if you have a mini batch of 16. That is to say, you will get through your training set half as fast. That's, um, that's pretty annoying. You, you don't want to be, be doing that. You, you want to be operating in this flat region where you have a horizontal line. And this is, this is fairly true for, for most matrix multiplications in deep learning. It's not just specific to LSTM. If you have a small mini batch, you will be bandwidth bound. And unless you can uh, increase the mini batch or do something else to reduce the bandwidth required, uh, you're going to be running at significantly lower performance than you could otherwise be doing. Um, because I have a P100, I could actually run this on the hardware. Uh, so this solid green line is what I actually achieved running on the hardware. And you can see it matches the theory really quite well. On the left, we are, we are getting linear performance increase with linear mini-batch increase. And on the right, we are pretty much saturated. We're running at near peak performance. You notice there's a bit of a, it drops off from theory a bit in the middle there, uh, around the sort of corner of the, of the model. Um, I guess we can explain this by saying that uh, to minimize the amount of uh, memory traffic you, you have, you tend to make some sacrifices in terms of how well you can fill the GPU cores. Uh, if you want to fill the GPU cores to the maximum, you tend to move a little bit more memory than you need to. So this, this sort of uh, off theory region between 8 and 64 is because we have a compromise whereby to, to be memory efficient, we, we sacrifice compute efficiency, and to be compute efficient, we sacrifice memory efficiency. And where they meet... There's, there's some complicated trade-offs which uh, are hard to deal with when you're the software engineer who has to implement the matrix multiplication algorithm. So that's why it doesn't quite match theory in the middle there. Um, so on the whole, after you've calculated your, your roofline model, you want to go a little bit further right of the, uh, the mini-batch requirement, otherwise you'll, uh, you'll be in this, this not-so-good region. Now, it's still, still pretty good. I mean... We're still seeing what, a, a throughput of about uh, 5,000 gigaflops when the peak's about 10,000. Still at 50% when we're, we're on a mini batch of 32. But if we go up to 64, we see a nearly 2x nearly speed up on that. Not quite, but nearly. So you really want to be a little bit up, up to the right of the shoulder. I say again, this is, this is true for most matrix multiplications that you do on a GPU. Uh, so mini batching is, is crucial. Okay, um, so, great, we're doing all right for time. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about some network level optimization. Oh, question. Uh, this is, the uh, is this graph dependent on the particular GPU? Like, what is yes. the difference? On okay. Yeah, so it depends on the uh, floating point throughput, the bandwidth ratio of your GPU. So uh, my particular GPU has a particular floating point throughput to bandwidth ratio. If you take a different GPU... This, this cutoff point is going to move slightly. Um, so uh, what I would advise is you look up the, the peak floating point throughput for your GPU and you look up the peak bandwidth, divide one by the other, and that, that should give you um, a target arithmetic intensity, which you can then map to the, the previous slide, which shows the arithmetic intensity of a matrix multiplication. Um, yeah, in general, there may, there may be factors of two, left or right, in where the shoulder actually hits, depending on what hardware you're running on. Okay, uh, so network level optimizations. Um, so, what do I mean by this? I mean, uh, what can we actually do without changing the result to optimize an LSTM? Yeah, we've seen that, that this mini-batch thing is a problem. We need a, a reasonable amount of mini-batch. Well, yes and no. There are some changes that we can do to reduce the memory used with a constant mini-batch. So there are, are three things I'm going to talk about. So given a fixed hidden state size and a fixed mini-batch, how can I make my network execute faster? Talk about three things. Uh, reducing memory traffic. So... Obviously, if, if we're in this, this memory bandwidth regime, then reducing memory traffic means 
uh, we're going to be more efficient. We're going to get more computational throughput. I'm going to talk about reducing overheads. So um, when you do uh, operations on hardware, it's not just the operations that you're doing. You also have to do uh, setup and several other things that, that add to some overheads. And these things can slow you down. If, you're, if your matrix multiplication algorithm is super fast, then maybe these overheads become an issue. And in fact, they do, and you will see why. And the third thing is increasing parallelism. As I said, GPs are parallel machines. In general, if, if we want best performance, uh, we want to be as parallel as possible. The, the hidden state size of 2048 I was using in the previous slides is quite a large hidden state size. As you reduce that, you get less parallelism. So you have to take care to make sure that you're filling the GPU with work, not just that you're uh, minimizing the, the other issues. So uh, this is based on a paper we published in Archive uh, last year, uh, which is referenced at the bottom. So there's a few more optimizations which I'm not going to talk about here, but which are covered in the paper. So the first optimization is uh, about reducing memory traffic. So we've, we've established before that, that memory traffic is bad. It, it stops us from getting our peak performance. So um, what can we do about that? Well, the first thing uh, I would say is that the majority of the memory is loading our parameter matrix. Now, in a recurrent neural network, a parameter matrix doesn't change over time. It is the same parameter matrix we're loading into each matrix multiplication. So we're loading it, doing our operation, then throwing it away. And then we're loading it, the same thing, again, doing our operation, throwing it away. Same thing comes down from memory again. We're doing our operation, we're throwing it away. That's, that seems awfully wasteful, um, and is awfully wasteful. And there are things we can do about reducing the amount of times that we load A. Uh, the more, if we're in this, this memory bandwidth bound regime, if we are in, uh, let's say, mini batch less than 128, just to pick out a number, then we are likely to see speed up if we uh, reduce the amount of times below day. So, uh, how does this look? So, here is my, my LSTM cell. Uh, all the equations are going on in, inside of there. I have my WT coming in at the bottom, I have my HD going out at the right, and the HT from the previous time step coming on the left, and we have our output HT as well going to the next layer. I'm going to unroll this over time. So this is the same thing unrolled over six time steps. Instead of HT, we now have uh, explicit time steps. So we have uh, W0 going in at the first time step, W5 going in at the five time, fifth time step, etc. And you can see that um, there's actually a interesting thing going on here. That is that the W inputs are all uh, independent and, and are available already, whereas the H inputs are dependent. They, re they require you to calculate the last time step. So there's something we can do based on the W inputs being independent, based on the fact that they don't require us to do the previous time step before we can operate on them. So... Um, Here's what we do. So the LSTM equations have many matrix multiplications of the form W something times the concatenation of WT and HT minus one. Um, the second line is essentially saying what we just saw in the graph. The, the input from the previous layer is WT and the input from the previous time step is HT minus one. Now, by doing some uh, staring at, at what matrix multiplication actually does, we, we notice that actually we can reformulate this as two separate matrix multiplications added together. Um, so I'm not going to show exactly how that works, but, but it, it sort of it just falls out from when you look at the operations that a matrix multiplication does. So we can split them off. And this is, this is exactly the same answer. This is, this is the same answer. There's no, no change here. But now we have two matrix multiplications. And we've separated the, the ones that are independent from the ones that are dependent. Um, functionally, as I said, this is the same. So going back to our previous uh, little image here, 
we can say that each arrow represents a matrix multiplication. We could say that the arrows with W on represent a matrix multiplication by W. The arrows with H on uh, represent a matrix multiplication with the H. So the optimization is therefore to group the vertical arrows. Uh, as I said before, we've got the same matrix at each time step. We're constantly using the same matrix. So we do something like this. Then we have W0 and W1 which can both be multiplied by the same matrix, A. And this is actually equivalent to increasing the mini-batch uh, for those two time steps by a factor of two. So as we saw before, increasing the mini-batch is, is a huge performance boost in some cases. So this is, this is quite interesting. Um, if you've been paying attention, you'll have noticed that I've, I've spoken about parallelism a little bit and how we like to keep parallelism. And by splitting these into two operations, we're making them sort of separate and not necessarily happening in parallel. Well, uh, GPUs have a way to compensate for this. We call it streams. So essentially, they are uh, ways to do coarse-grained parallelism. So I can throw one matrix multiplication to one stream and concurrently run another matrix multiplication in another stream. Uh, so that's what we use to, to keep the parallelism in this case. So yeah, by doing this, we've, we've increased the effective mini-batch of half of our work, and we've kept the parallelism the same. Now I've chosen two to combine over. Um, you can choose more, you can choose less. Uh, exactly what the best choice is isn't actually as clear-cut as you'd think. So you'd think, well, larger mini-batch is, is better, so why don't I just group them all up? Well, if you do that, then, then because you have a dependency between W and H, you end up having less parallelism because uh, H can't start until W has completed. So you need to have a balance, a trade-off here between the parallelism and the, the bandwidth reduction. And as we saw before, increasing the mini-batch doesn't help beyond a certain point. So uh, exactly how much to group depends on a few factors. There's an advanced technique to deal with the recurrent time steps. So this, this increases the effective mini-batch of our, our input uh, matrix multiplications. How can we deal with the recurrent matrix multiplications? Um, there's no easy way, but there is an advanced technique. This came out of uh, Silicon Valley AI Lab, uh, Baidu Silicon Valley AI Lab. And they have proposed a method where you keep the parameters that you're constantly reloading in very uh, low-level on-chip memory, which has a very high read bandwidth. So we're still, I guess, loading it each time, but we're doing it from a much faster memory space. Um, they've shown that, that for a mini-batch of four, this can get about half of the peak floating point throughput of the GPU, uh, which is uh, roughly a 10x speed up over what you could do with a mini-batch of four not using this method. There are drawbacks, so you know this, this on-chip memory is of limited space, so you can't fit a large matrix onto there, it just doesn't fit in. Uh, as I said, it's, it's some quite advanced programming techniques are required to actually get it to work at all, but it is something that uh, may become more prevalent in the future and is an, a really neat way of getting uh, small mini-batches to uh, go to a recurrent neural network fast. I've got the reference there at the bottom if anyone wants to check it out. It's presented at ICML. So the second optimization, we've talked about bandwidth reduction. Now I'm going to talk about overhead reduction. So here are the equations that we saw before. Um, I've been talking about the matrix, matrix multiplication entirely. Now I'm going to talk about these, uh, these point-wise operations. So while each individually may be fairly cheap, we have, what, 11 of them? 11 of them. Added together, they, they add a bit of overhead. Um, it's, it's not a lot individually, but together, there's, there's a bit of overhead in there, and ideally, we want to get rid of that. So what do we do? So a naive implementation, um, and this, this is something that, that a lot of frameworks, I, I believe, still would do uh, with, with a lot of RNN implementations is uh, to implement each of these pointwise operations as a separate kernel. Now, if you take your favorite, favorite framework and, and have a vector and you do tan h vector, then 
the, na the naive way of doing that is just, just to launch a, a kernel, a GPU kernel, to do 10H of the vector. And each of these kernels comes with overhead. Uh, the CPU has to set up the communication with the GPU because you're launching the kernel on the CPU. So it sets up the communication with the GPU. That adds a few microseconds. Uh, for each pointwise operation, you're launching a, a thread. So for each of the elements in your vector, you have a single thread which then launches to do it. And that adds a little bit of overhead. And um, you, that thread then, then reads the value, does the operation, and writes the value. And that adds a bit of overhead. It also adds quite a bit of bandwidth, because as we saw before, my simple C equals A plus B was extremely bandwidth bound. And this is also extremely bandwidth bound. So that adds quite a bit of bandwidth, and we're constantly loading and installing this memory. So what can we do about that? Well, we use a technique known as fusion. So if you have pointwise operations, there's no uh, complex communication pattern between them. There's no reason why, why we have to launch multiple kernels. A kernel is a set of parallel operations. We can, we can do all of these pointwise operations the way the equations are formulated in a single kernel, in a single set of parallel operations. And this reduces the overheads a lot. So on the top, I have... You can see I have my two matrix multiplications streamed together. That's what's going on on the left. And then I have these single individual bars, and each of these is a pointwise operation. It looks like I have slightly more than 11 here, so I'm not, not entirely sure what I was calculating in this case, but I've got slightly more than 11. Um, I fused them together, and now I have one. And you can see that the timeline now uh, stops after that single small block. And then I could, I could start the execution of another matrix multiplication, or whatever comes next in my algorithm. Uh, that's about a 2x speed up, fusing these pointwise operations together. And, I mean, I, I sort of highlight this one in particular because it's something that oftentimes uh, simple, you know, you can construct a lot of things by putting pointwise operations back to back. There's a lot of interesting things you can create, but it's quite hard, and it's technically quite hard to do this, this fusion generally. So a lot of the times the frameworks just, just won't do it. And so you will be seeing this, this top half of the plot if you, if you load up your uh, network in, in a profiling tool. Now, fixing this yourselves can vary from quite tricky to quite easy. It depends exactly on the framework support. Um, it's, it is possible, though. You can go in and, and do some GPU programming and fix this if, it's a, if you think it's going to be a particular issue for your model. Um, and as I said, it, in this case, this particular case, it's worth about 2x speed up. So the third optimization I wanted to talk about was increasing parallelism. So this diagram shows a multi-layer RNN. So uh, it's the same as before. Each of my, my blocks implements a single time step for an uh, RNN cell. And we stack them on top of each other so that... Um, uh, we have multiple layers, each with independent weights. So there's slightly different shades of green here. I don't know if you can make them out, but they have different uh, weight matrices. Now, the, again, the, the naive implementation you will often see is we'll do the whole of the first layer, complete it, and then we'll start in the second layer. Do the whole of the second layer, complete it, and we'll start in the third layer. This isn't exposing as much parallelism to the GPU as you could you could do more operations concurrently on the GPU. As I said right at the start, GPUs are parallel machines. It, they like it when you put more operations onto them. Uh, it tends to make them run more efficiently. So what does the, the execution pattern look like if we do that? So we're assuming we're not grouping across time, just for this example, because it looks a bit prettier if I do that. So we start with this bottom left input. We execute that block, and then we have this wave front that propagates across. When we get, once we get to this point, we now have about three times as many operations going on on the GPU as once. We have three times as much parallelism. If we have a particularly small model, this is very good in terms of performance improvement. If we have a large model, then often the large model is enough parallelism on its own. But if we have a particularly small model, this, this technique uh, really does give quite good speed-ups by increasing parallelism on the GPU, by filling all of the GPU's resources. So that propagates across, and we have a similar sort of tail at the end where we're, we're slowly decreasing in parallelism. If the sequence length is long enough, then the start and tail don't really have much impact. 
So I showed a profiler plot before. This is another profiler plot. And in this case, well, same as before, the, the vertical um, things are streams. So you can see on the left we have stream 13 through 20. And each of these is a, a um, sort of an independent uh, thread of work which is going on concurrently. The x-axis is time. You can see that we have many operations running on the GPU at once. We've uh, got a lot of work being scheduled and overlapping concurrently. Now, the GPU won't overlap things if it doesn't have uh, free resources. So we can see that, that in this particular case, we have quite a bit of free resources which we're able to fill by using these streams. So I did these three optimizations on an LSTM with 512 hidden units, so H equals 512, 100 recurrent iterations, 100 time steps, mini batch of 64 and four layers. Uh, before I did these optimizations, it took 83.6 milliseconds a pass, so that's to a forward pass for a single mini batch. And after I did them, it took 23.8 milliseconds a pass. So that's about three and a half times speed up uh, from those three optimizations on this network. Now, I, uh, I would say that it's, it's hard to pin down exactly you know, the, the weight of each optimization. I said that the point-wise operations were about two times, but if you don't do some of the other optimizations, then you know, it, that they synergize a little bit, which makes it sort of hard to pin down the exact impact of each one. Um, but combined, it's, it's worth about 3.5 times speed up. So uh, you may be thinking, he, he said that the frameworks don't necessarily do these optimizations. Oh dear, I don't want to do these myself. Well, uh, it turns out that for uh, things like, like LSTM, Standard things like LSTM, uh, these are provided in the library. Um, however, that they, they may not be you know, provided in exactly the form that you want. So it's important, I think it's important to, to understand these things and know about them because a lot of the times you'll be looking at networks and you'll be tweaking them and you'll be coming up with things which may not look like something that the people who write the QDNN library have seen before. And as such, if, you, if you've not seen that before, then you're unable to... Uh, to optimize it well. So you will occasionally have to understand these optimizations and perhaps implement them if you want best performance. Anyway, we, we provide this library QDNN. Uh, it's integrated into all major frameworks. It provides optimized routines for many neural network architectures, uh, so convolutional neural networks. Uh, it has pooling layers, convolutional layers, um, softmax layers, uh, batch normalization, dropout, a lot of things that you may not have covered yet. But it has a lot of uh, functionality for accelerating um, neural networks. Sometimes you'll have to explicitly enable this in your framework. Uh, but as I said, all major ones support it. Um, this QDNN includes basic RNNs, so standard single gate RNNs, uh, GRUs, and LSTMs, uh, implemented with all the optimizations I've been talking about before. Uh, there's a link there where you can go and read more. Uh, NVIDIA also has other libraries, uh, BLAST operations, so matrix multiplications, matrix vector multiplications. Uh, there's actually, the, the, the BLAST um, specification has, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 different operations, all of which are supported by the QBLAST, the uh, NVIDIA's BLAST library. There's FFT libraries, random number generation libraries, uh, libraries to do transformations on images, uh, there's all sorts, so um, I would check out developer.nvidia.com um, if you think that you've, you've got an operation that is taking a bit of time and you think it might have been done before by someone, it may be in one of these libraries. So I guess I want to close with this. Um, I would say that performance is important as, a, as someone who's, who's working on neural networks. It's... it's Choices you make can influence how long it takes to train your neural network, and that can that ultimately can have a big impact on your productivity. Um, both software and hardware choices uh, can greatly reduce your time to solution. You saw the throughput graphs for a CPU versus a GPU. Um, 
So, you know, I'm from NVIDIA, I like GPUs, and I think the data uh, suggests and the, the users suggest that many people looking at deep learning also like GPUs. Um, it's important to be aware of the performance trade-offs uh, you met, you're making when you're designing a network. If you design a network which only works when you're training it with a mini batch of one, you, and it does matrix multiplications, you are potentially 60 times slower than if it would work if you could use a mini batch of 64. That's, that's a big slowdown that you're designing in. Now, it may be you can come up with a way that, you know, with a day's more thought that, that this network can be trained with um, more than a mini batch of one, in which case you will see a big speed up. But you've got to be aware that this is, this is something that actually has a very big impact on the performance and your productivity. Um, libraries and frameworks exist. Uh, frameworks, you know, framework writers spend a lot of time thinking about performance, trying to get as much performance as possible. But it's, it's generally hard to get performance on code you haven't seen. You can try very hard, uh, but it's, it's a very challenging thing to do. And, and it's, you're always uh, going to be able to be doing better if you, if you know what the problem looks like before you start programming. Um, although that can, can be time consuming. So in a lot of cases, I would say that frameworks and libraries are just the way forward. And, and you hopefully won't have to dig into lower level stuff. But you should be aware that, that it is a possibility. And you should be aware that when something is taking slightly longer than you think it should, just consider things like memory bandwidth and how you might be able to optimize for that. And this goes, goes doubly so when you're you know, developing new models, uh, researching new ideas. Thanks. So please do ask questions. Um, we've got plenty of time. Are you aware of uh, any work being done on um, hardware that uh, um, provides speed up by reducing uh, the, for example, the precision of, of uh, number representation? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a hot topic at the moment, uh, reduce, reduce precision neural networks. Um, it works really quite well at test time. Uh, it's, it's more challenging to get it to work when you're training. Uh, but if you can reduce the precision down to 16 bits, for example, then suddenly you've got half as much memory traffic and you can design uh, compute units which go twice as fast. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a hot area in, in hardware research at the moment. And our, our inference targeted chips, so, um, uh, well, I, I, could, I could name product lines, but they probably wouldn't mean much to you. So the P40, the P4, and the G4 series chips all have fast int8 uh, hardware for doing inference calculations. That's, that's one uh, byte per value, rather than four. <coughs> that also increases your uh, memory bandwidth and what can <coughs> store in memory as well. Yeah, memory capacity as well. There's also four X on that. Yeah, that's a good point. How early in development would you have to like, start thinking about this? Say you have some kind of model and now you write it to Yeah, there's, there's multiple levels you can start looking at it. As I said, if you, if you start designing a, a architecture and you realize you can only have a mini batch one and you see that quite early, then obviously that's something that you, uh, maybe you want to go ahead with it. Maybe you're, you're fine with the, the performance as it is, but it's something that you're, you're at least prepared for. So you, I think you should, you should think about it as early as possible, but that doesn't mean you have to think about it at the start. You can go to a model that already works do some changes and make it run fast. Things like enabling CUDNN, for example, can, can give a, a, like a 5x speed up on, on certain networks. Um, so that you can do right at the end if you haven't done it yet, quite often. So it's, I, think, I think at all stages it should be in, in your mind somewhere. Um, but uh, exactly whether it's needed or not is, it depends on the problem. Does the CUDNN Libraries support multiple variants of OSCMs uh, for overcurrent nets, um, and if not yet, disclosing? Um, yeah, a few variants. So bidirectional nets it supports. Um, 
but not that many when you're changing around the, the uh, uh, equations inside. So there's, there's GRUs, uh, LSTMs with the equations that I showed, and uh, RNNs with TANH and ReLU activation functions. Uh, which LSTM did it, did it use? Did it use the one with the uh, separate hidden layer size, or did it use the one where the hidden layer size is, uh, is just in the output times this stuff? It uses this one. So, uh, yeah, we don't have a, a, uh, a parameterized input into the last equation. Okay, cool. Okay, well, if there's no more questions. So, um, one thing I was going to say at the end is hopefully you all uh, received an email from Janus um, this week letting you know that Microsoft has very generously donated a, a bunch of um, compute time to you for the practical. So, you should all be able to get accounts on Microsoft Azure uh, and use their GPUs. You've got um, some budget of hours, so you can try out lots of these things. I think they're um, all Maxwell GPUs, or not. they might be Pascal. Um, but yes, you can try out some of these things uh, you've seen from Jeremy. Um, and to emphasize what Jeremy's saying, uh, this seems a bit esoteric, but developing sort of deep learning models is a bit like being a software engineer 40 years ago. Um, you have to worry about the hardware, and the hardware is changing quite quickly, um, because these chips are originally built for games, uh, they're still developing uh, towards the sorts of things we do in deep learning. Um, and every year they're changing. So just this year we have Pascal chips. Uh, we have much wider memory bandwidth between them. That changes the sort of models we can build. Um, and so sort of being at the forefront of deep learning also involves being at the, the forefront of what the hardware can do. But, um, oh, Andrew. Um, just to that point, can you speak to uh, anything other than, I guess, you know, reduced uh, precision? Um, I, I can't really say anything about unannounced hardware, sorry. But yes. But yes. <laughs> be, there's, a, there's always new things. Huh? Yeah, there's always new things. I can say that. It always gets better. Am I even allowed to answer that question? I'm not sure. No, you can say all, it's always a good time. To So th the way we do it in QDNN is that we allow you to specify um, or slightly indirectly specify uh, the length of each uh, example in your batch. Uh, and that means that as you get towards the, the tail end of the RNN computation, it effectively is calculating with a slightly smaller mini batch each time, which um, means that you reduce the, the, the you don't calculate on zeros which is always a, an efficiency gain. Now, uh, how much impact that actually has depends on your overall mini-batch and the distribution of, of sequence lengths. Um, there's, uh, as you say, you can, you can group them so your mini-batches are all roughly the same size. Uh, there's another trick that people do where they um, uh, have, if you, if you have a, enough memory, then you can get multiple examples, you can place an example here, then a break, and then another example, and you can pack them into one forward pass. So you can pack multiple examples into one forward pass. So that's a trick some people use. Thank you. Which platform are you using for staying most up to date on NVIDIA GPUs? Just which cloud providers tend to stay most up to date on GPUs, and Amazon seems to stay pretty far behind? Uh, are there any ones I mean, that know about this? I guess they all work in cycles, so uh, I, I think um, I think they all stay fairly close. Yeah. There's also a legacy effect. The more you buy, the longer it takes you to replace them all. Um, but if you're just starting, it's easy to get the latest ones. <laughs>